Welcome to Jesus School. Matthew chapter number 6 and verse 13, the last verse in the Lord's Prayer uh, this morning, the model prayer, the disciples' prayer. People call it all sorts of different things. Uh, We have uh, enjoyed working through it over the last few weeks. Just to remind you, the model prayer is a daily prayer that is designed to help the followers of Jesus communicate with the Father and live on mission. We all need help. We all need help. We need to learn what do we talk to the Father about? How do we pray? Model prayer helps us with that. And then how do I live on mission every single day? You know, seven days a week, 365 days a year until the day I see Jesus face to face. How do I live on mission? And the model prayer helps us with that. Uh, So here it is. Pray like this, Jesus says. Disciple, follower, believer, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So start with, who is he? Father. Where is he? He's in heaven. Revelation 4, lightnings and thunders and elders and emerald rainbow and sea of glass. And I hear it, I feel it. Father in heaven, epic wonder. May your name be kept holy. Every time you say the words, may your name be kept holy, your voice harmonizes with the four living creatures that are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And the Lord, just like Nebuchadnezzar said, lo, there are four in the fire. Uh, I think the father says, lo, there are five singing now. There was only four before, but now Chad started singing. So now there's five saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, right? Who is he? Where is he? And what's he like? He's holy. And then what's he about? His kingdom and his will. And we've unpacked those little by little then the second, that's kind of the first half of the prayer. And then the second half of the prayer, uh, we, we are introduced to three inevitables that give birth to three prayers. Three inevitables of life that every single one of you are going to face every day. And these three inevitables give rise and present a need for three prayers. The, the inevitables are hunger, human hon- conflict, and satanic harassment. And so therefore the prayers is, Father, provide for my daily bread, Father, forgive me as I forgive others. And Father, protect me from the evil one. Right? And so this is how Jesus ends the prayer. Um, so this is how what that sounds like. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Now, normally, if I was going through the normal means of things, I would take a teaching right now to talk to you about forgiveness. However, uh, we got a wonderful teaching on forgiveness just a few weeks ago where Dustin taught on forgiveness, and he actually touched on this part of the model prayer. This also gives me an opportunity to remind you that we have the most wonderfully curated content of our previous teachings all stored and arranged very easily on our YouTube page. Maybe you don't know that we have that. That's the thing that we, that's where we put all of our resources. So you can look at past series for the last several years. You can see every teaching uh, from Jesus School, uh, very well edited. And I also want to say, so thank you, Dustin, for teaching a wonderful teaching on forgiveness. I would encourage all of you, if you haven't heard it, go listen to it. And then also, thank you to Justin and Jess Brown for uh, curating that content for us. Uh, for years, they've been doing this every week. And um, they, don't, they don't get any glory for it, right? Um, but uh, it is so helpful. It's a gift to our church. And they're faithfully recording. And then on Sunday and on Monday, they edit and they upload and all of that for us to be able to have that content available to us. So Thank you, Justin. And Jess is at home, but Jess is listening now. Thank you, Jess. Or, or she'll be listening at least when she edits the video later. Thank you, Jess, uh, for, uh, for all your hard work. Okay, continuing on. So that means what I'm teaching on today for a few minutes that we have is this la- these last two phrases. Don't, let us, uh, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. All right, so l- let's... Uh, let's reword uh, the statement, don't lead us into temptation. How, how could we expand on that? How would the Amplified Version have that? What is Jesus getting at here when he teaches us to pray, when he teaches you to pray, Father, don't lead me into temptation today. What are we saying there? Well, here's a um, possible reword. Father, guide our paths away from the storms of temptation that would cause us to sin and dishonor your name. I think that reword gets to the heart 
of what you're saying when you say, lead us not into temptation. Guide our paths. You are the guider of my path. You lead me, Father. Lead my path away from the storms of temptation that I'm not ready for. That would be too hard for me today. It would be too much for me today. I don't want to sin and dishonor your name. I think that gets to the heart of it. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, we're asking God to help us avoid situations in which temptations would easily overtake us and to give us freedom from Satan's captivity. Right? Let's, uh, so let's talk about temptation for a few minutes. Now, when, I, when we talk about temptation in a group like this, uh, it would be very easy for the enemy to come, as we talk about sin right now, for the enemy to come and heap all sorts of shame on you. Uh, shame is uh, a voice that comes to you and says, you're a bad person, right? That's the enemy. The Lord never does that. He would never say something like that to you. So you may even hear the enemy's voice come to you during this teaching. We're going to have an opportunity at the end of this teaching um, to release anything that the Holy Spirit might bring to mind that you need to confess. So the Holy Spirit encourages you and brings a measure of guilt and invites you to release your sin because it's harmful. The enemy comes and heaps shame on you and says, you don't want to go to God. You're a bad person. He doesn't want to hear from you. So it's likely in a teaching like we're going to give over the next couple minutes, you might hear both voices just to help to identify them. These are, these are the sources of those two. And we'll have an opportunity. You know what? Church and the, the Father's house is one of the best places uh, to come and get clean. So we'll have an opportunity for that if you need that at the end of the teaching. All right, let's talk about temptation for a couple minutes. What is temptation? Temptation is the act of enticing or luring someone in order to make them fall into sin. Enticing or luring in order to make them fall into sin. There are two primary components to temptation. They have to have a real opportunity to sin. It's not a temptation if there's not a real opportunity, okay? <laughs> uh, you have to have a real opportunity to sin. For instance, okay, uh, I, I cannot be tempted with a million-dollar car. I don't have a million dollars. There's no real temptation there, right? It's, like, it's a car. There's no real opportunity for me to buy that car. It's just a car, right? There has to be a real opportunity to sin, and then deceptive messaging that comes along with it that entices us to sin. So there's an opportunity, and then all of a sudden now, the propaganda campaign, the enticement, now the voices starting to tell me to justify this sin, tell me why I, I should be able to partake in this. Both of those two things together is what makes up temptation in your life. All right? What Jesus teaches us here in the last two statements of the model prayer is that temptation is not impersonal. Temptation is not impersonal, meaning it's not just a function of the flesh, right? Temptation is not just a function of the flesh. No. This prayer makes it clear that temptation comes from the evil one. Temptation in your life comes from a person. It's not just a function of your flesh. All temptation to sin comes from the tempter. All temptation to sin, uh, to sin comes from the tempter, which is what the devil is called in Matthew chapter number four. The tempter came to Jesus in the wilderness. All temptation to sin comes from the tempter, either directly or indirectly, right? There could be the direct assault where the enemy comes right to you and all of a sudden uh, you hear a little voice in your head Thoughts come into your mind. You begin to rationalize you being able, you should, I should be able to partake in this sin, right? And so as the messaging comes, that's a direct temptation, but it can be indirect as well. It can come from the mouth of a friend, right? Where the friend is actually being advised by Satan and he's convincing me, come on, Jared, come on, come on, right? God has his prophets and Satan has his prophets. God's prophets hear a message from the Lord and say, this is for you, right? I'm the conduit of his message. And Satan has his prophets, right? Where he comes to you and says, here's the sin. Why don't you take it, right? This comes directly from the evil one. He's using me to tempt you and to entice you. But all temptation to sin comes either directly or indirectly from the tempter. The Lord gives a very stark warning, a very strong warning in Luke chapter number 17 and verse number one. The Lord Jesus says, temptation's gonna come, but woe to the person through whom temptation comes. Do not be 
a prophet. Do not be a mouthpiece for the enemy in, bringing, in encouraging others to sin. Luke 17, 1. All temptation to sin is satanic. It's demonic. All temptation to sin is demonic. It smells like Satan, right? Those of you who smell in the spirit, you can smell it, can't you, right? Uh, I walked in here this morning, as some of you did as well, and you probably smelled some musty stuff. There's all sorts of smells all around the building today. Thank you, Chris and Ashley, for working to make it smell better because it's better than I think it was. Um, but our, we got our you know, sewer water and stuff that's, that's making this place kind of smell a little bit. But um, when, uh, when temptation comes, I recognize that that's Satan. That's a demon. It smells like Satan. It's slimy like Satan, right? My father would never say that. Where did that thought come from? That's satanic. That's demonic. He lures us in with the promise of pleasure and then uses deceptive messaging to convince us to take a bite. Right? I see you eating that donut, that donut right there, right? We could use this as an example, right? This would taste so good. This won't mess up your diet at all. You want this. It tastes wonderful. And then the messaging campaign comes, right? <laughs> uh, this is what the enemy did in, in the original temptation in the garden, right? You'll really want to eat from this fruit. This will bring you so much pleasure to have this knowledge of both good and evil. You want this. It lures us in with the potential pleasure and then uses deceptive messaging to convince us to take it and take a bite. So what does that deceptive messaging sound like? I don't know what it sounds like for you. Let me tell you what it sounds like for me. Here's 12 ways that the enemy comes and entices me to sin. Jared, this will make you happy. It will satisfy you. That's a lie. <laughs> How many years do we have to live with that lie before we realize it will not satisfy you? You deserve this. You can handle it. Jared, other people do it. Even other people you know. Other people in ministry do it, Jared. It's the Jones effect. Satan uses the Jones effect. Uh, no one will find out. No one will find out. It's not illegal. Right? Do it. It's not get to legal. This could be the last time. Just one more time. What's one more time going to hurt? You've done it a hundred times already, Jared. One more time. Uh, it's not hurting anybody. You're all by yourself, Jared. You're all by yourself in your room. You're not hurting anybody. What's actually wrong with it? I mean, really, let's break it down. What's actually wrong with this? a question that the enemy comes with. Uh, what did God actually say? Hey, that's, a, that's, that's like he shows his card, right? When he says that, it's like, you know, okay, that's demonic. Come on, that's blatantly demonic. Genesis chapter number three. What did God actually say about this? Just do it. God will forgive you. Ooh, that's a deceptive one. He's forgiven you in the past. Just do it. He'll forgive you again. To use the grace of God and the forgiveness of God as a license to justify our sin. Deceptive messaging. Now, if, unless you're told that this is Satan or a demon, right? Unless you're told that, you may think that this is just your own mind, just generating thoughts. This is just natural rationalization, but that's not a Christian worldview. The Christian worldview that Jesus gives us is that temptation comes from the evil one. Temptation comes from the tempter. So we recognize this as the enemy. So how is, how is the, where is the, where is the devil in your life? Do you think the devil's real? Do you think demons are real? You could answer that with, yes, let me tell you about the last time he tempted me. And let me tell you what he tried to say to get me to give in to temptation. I know the voice of the enemy, right? Satan's lies are so effective because most people generally don't recognize his voice. They don't recognize the voice of the spirit and they don't recognize the voice of Satan, interestingly, huh? Most people don't recognize this as the enemy's voice and they don't know truth. They don't know God's truth. So man, if you don't know that this is the enemy, and if you don't know God's truth, I mean, what hope do you have against the enemy? You are hopeless against the enemy until you recognize his voice and know truth. J.I. Packer said that most people 
walk like this through life. So imagine this guy, blindfolded, ears plugged, right? And he's walking through a busy city street, just kind of wandering about, right? He says, this is what most people are like in their spiritual warfare, completely clueless. The enemy's all around, danger's all around. They get hit by a car here, you know? And it's, it's like, but they have no clue because they're blind and they've not heard truth. Very effective. This is the way most people live their life. And so every day is a constant giving in to temptation. Day after day after day after day. The enemy steals and kills and destroys and they're completely clueless as to why this is happening to them. You've heard the statement, the struggle's real. How many of you used to say the struggle's real? I don't think any, many people say it anymore. Okay, good. How many of you still say the struggle's real with that one? Anybody still say that? No, okay. It was, so it was something that was like 15 years ago. I thought it was. Okay, the struggle's real is something that people used to say. A little history lesson for you teenagers that haven't heard that yet. Um, you do? Okay, good. Uh, so let's acknowledge that living in a world of daily temptation is difficult. Can we all acknowledge that? Living in a world of daily temptation is difficult. The reality is that there will never be a day when you aren't tempted. Is that encouraging today? Put that on a cup, right? <laughs> there will never be a day in which I am not tempted by Satan, right? The Lord of the flies. This is one reason why the Bible presents the Christian life as a wrestling match, a struggle, a fight, a war. This is our Christian life. Your adversary is highly organized and constantly adjusting his strategy. His strategy is different for you than it is for somebody your same age in Venezuela. It's a different strategy. His strategy is different for you, Miss Carol, today than it, w it was when you were 40, and that was different from when you were 20. He is, he is highly sophisticated. He's constantly changing his tactics, right? Uh, for a great, like, insight, imagination of what this is like, listen to screw tape, screw tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. How many of you have read or listened to Screw Tape Letters before? Very good, yeah. So you can get it, you can hear it for free on, uh, on YouTube. It's really effective, but it's a veteran demon talking to his nephew about uh, tempting Christians to sin and what their approach is and all of that. Very, very, uh, very insightful. As a young man, the greatest temptations in my life were to lie, let's say 20 years ago, to lie, to cheat, to steal, to disrespect my parents, to destroy property. Why was that ever a thing? To cuss, to lust, to look at porn, to get drunk, to get high, to hook up, to waste my money, to watch bad movies, to waste my time, to ignore God, and to visit disreputable establishments. These were the greatest temptations of my life 20 years ago. The greatest temptations that I would have to fight hard. This is where the struggle was. As, as my friend groups, I had a good friend group, and then I had several bad friend groups, and those several bad friend groups, these things that I just said, was just normal fare for them. It was a normal weekend, that kind of stuff. And it was luring. It was, I wanted friends. I wanted to be included. I wanted to laugh with these guys. I wanted to have a, a good time with these guys. But as soon as I walked into that friend group, then all these temptations, and it was just, it was, it was, it was a struggle. It was a fight. Now I'm 39. I'm not tempted with those things on a daily basis. The enemy has changed his strategy for me. Now, every day I'm tempted with things like harboring bitterness, being proud, delaying forgiveness, being angry, withdrawing from community, uh, stop reading the word, justify sin, sit in judgment of others, don't trust God, hoard all your resources and don't share, live for yourself, uh, trust in doctors more than God, Make decisions based on fear and not faith. Ignore the promptings of the Spirit. Be critical of others. Be lazy. Gossip. Complain. And how destructive are all these things? Destructive. The enemy knows exactly how destructive these are. And so he tempts me with these things. His strategy changes, but he never stops bringing temptation. The struggle is real, but can I testify that the struggle is also redeeming? The struggle is redeeming. 
Enduring temptation is a part of the process of becoming like Jesus. The day you got saved, the father could have taken his huge hand that can measure the, the, the universe with a span, right? He could have taken his huge, massive hand in heaven, and he could have said, no more temptation to sin. He could have done that. He could have turned off that little mechanism inside of you that hears the enemy's voice. He could have closed up your ears so that you never hear the enemy again, and all those lies would never come to you. He could have turned off the Lord to sinful pleasure. The father could have done that. He has chosen not to do that. He has chosen to leave us in a world where we are faced with temptation every single day. Why? Because the very act of resisting temptation overcomes and exposes the weakness of the devil. The struggle is by design. The father from his throne in heaven with, with his son on the right side of him can look down and can see his bride, can see you and I resisting temptation, saying no to the enemy. And it is in this way that he is able to show the entire cosmos, the entire universe, the principalities in the, in the heavenly spaces, right? The demons that roam the earth looking for somebody to inhabit. It is by this that the father can say, look, the enemy does not have power over my people. The power that I give them is strong enough to, to allow them to endure and to overcome your greatest weapons of assault, of temptation, your lure to pleasure. Look at that. Look at what my bride is doing. Our daily struggle, as we overcome by the power of the Spirit, exposes to the whole cosmos that His love is more powerful than lust. That the devotion that we have with the Father is the strongest power in the universe. And it's on display every time you say no. And that pleases the Father. So he said, I, I know the bride could fall into sin by being tempted like this every day. But that's worth it. I'll strengthen them. I'll have endless forgiveness for them. And this is how I want them to live their life. In the struggle, learning bit by bit how gracious the Lord is, how faithful the Lord is every time I fall, and how strengthened I can be as I begin to rely on your spirit. The struggle is redeeming. So how does the Father deliver us from the evil one? We've talked a little bit about temptation. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. How does the Father answer that prayer I have three suggestions. Number one, how does the Father deliver us? First, he unites us with his Son. Can I just say an obvious thing here real quick? Okay? Deliverance is for believers. There's like, there's some debate about that still in some churches that don't know much about the Spirit. Deliverance is for believers. It's right there in the model prayer. The Christian is supposed to say, deliver me from e the evil one or the evil ones. Deliver us from demons. Deliverance, a prayer for deliverance, is for believers. It's right there in the model prayer. Okay, so how does the Father deliver us? Number one, he unites us with his Son. Union with Christ overcomes temptation and the evil one. How do I overcome lust, Jesus? How do I overcome fear, Jesus? How do I overcome fill in the blank? Jesus is the answer. Union with Christ is the greatest gift we've been given for the struggle, right? I mean, you think about it. There's only one who went toe to toe with the devil for 40 days in the wilderness and overcame. There is only one who lived a perfect sinless life and was assaulted by real temptations. He really had an opportunity to sin. He truly did. They were real and genuine for Jesus. He was tempted to sin for 33 years and every single time he said no. Now, I want that guy on my team. And if the father says, not only will he be on your team, but how about I send him to live inside of you? Will that help you overcome temptation? Yes, that's the greatest strategy ever. The greatest gift I could ever be given, right? Against temptation is for the one who overcame temptation to be living inside of me. That's why every time there's a sin problem, we say the answer is Jesus. The one who overcame temptation inside of you. And in our union with him, we are strengthened to be able to handle every temptation of the enemy. Hebrews chapter number two. Because he himself, because Jesus himself has suffered when tempted, he was tempted, he is able, active 
tense from the throne right now. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus is. Not the, not the words of Jesus, necessarily, that he spoke 2,000 years ago. Not that these necessarily words are able to help you when you're being tempted. The living Christ who spoke the words right now, he is able to help those who are being tempted. I love when our Rafa room team says, let's invite Jesus into the room right now. Why? Because this verse is a reality, and they live this reality every time you all say, let's invite Jesus into this memory. Why? Because he's alive, and he is able to help those who are being tempted. Union with Christ. He unites us with his son who lives to help us overcome temptation. As you abide in him, his spirit produces godly character inside of you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Are you struggling with sin? Our answer, it's not just a religious answer. Abide in Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Abide in Jesus. But shouldn't I get the certain app for my phone? Abide in Jesus. If you want the app, that's fine. But the app's not going to help you. Abide in Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Go abide in Jesus this week, and you'll have more victory over sin. Abide in Jesus. He'll produce self-control inside of you so that when the apple or the donut is put in front of you, you'll smirk and laugh and say, no. Right? When the temptation comes, when you're all by yourself, you'll say, nice try. No. You know? And you're like, oh, wait, that used to be a struggle. Now it's just no. What changed? Jesus. 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 Number two. How does the Father deliver us? He unites us with the Son. Number two, he faithfully provides escape routes or routes. Uh, every great action movie, I love the action movies that are filled with escape routes, right? Like you're running from the enemy, boom, you hit this door and you hit this alley and you jump over, whatever, whether it's Jason Bourne or, or uh, Ethan Hunt or a- any of them, right? And like all the escape routes that they take, right? He's always one of the most fun parts of an action movie. So the escape route concept is the Father's idea. The Father's been giving escape routes since Adam. It's a true story. Escape routes. Well, here, so let me show you the verse. You know the verse. Most of you do. The Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you, Christian, that is not common to man. It's common. You're not being tempted any worse than the rest of us. It's common. But God is faithful. The Father is is faithful. Remember, every time Paul uses the word God, like 99% of the time, he's referring to the Father. The Father is faithful. The Father answers the Lord's prayer. Believers pray the Lord's prayer. Father, deliver us from the evil one. And the Father is faithful to answer that prayer. The Father's faithful. The Father will faithfully answer that prayer in your life. How will he do it? He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. So he limits Satan's permissions. You will never be tempted beyond your ability. I I, I like that. That's that's great. But with the temptation, he will provide escape routes, the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. So remember, temptations come every single day, but the Father is faithful. And the Father makes sure that every time a temptation comes, so does an escape route. 100 times out of 100, because the Father is faithful in an escape route. You'll notice it. It's this little moment where you have an opportunity to not engage. It's the, it's the prompting of the Spirit, but it's the Father's faithfulness on display where he says, oh no, don't do that. Here's your way of escape. Here's your way of escape. I can be harboring uh, bitterness towards Candace for a brief moment, and uh, she does something that offends me, and I can, I can choose to harbor it, but before I begin harboring that anger, which will lead to bitterness and then unforgiveness. Right before that, the Father's faithful to say, apologize or humble or let it go. There's, there's this escape route where I don't have to engage in the sin because every time there's a temptation to sin, there's also the Father's faithfulness in giving us a way out. One of the things that we do with our boys is when they sin, I try to sit them down, and I, and I, I don't do it every time, 
but I try to say, okay, now hold on, now, now you sinned there, you messed up. Let's, can we think about, it just happened like a minute ago, right? About one second before you sinned, did you have a thought come to your mind that maybe I shouldn't do this? That was the escape route. The Father's faithfulness uh, attended your temptation, and that was your opportunity. So next time, when you hear that little voice, take it. Take the escape route. This is one of the ways that the Father answers the Lord's prayer, is by giving you escape routes. Take them. And lastly, number three. How does the Father deliver us? He unites us with the Son, He faithfully provides escape routes, and He gives us the ministry of deliverance. He gives to us, the church, the ministry of deliverance. We find the Father's deliverance in deliverance ministry inside the church. We see this in two ways. Number one, through regular intercession. The believer, you and I, are to pray every day for deliverance from the evil one for ourselves. And remember, for others, it's deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one, right? This is a corporate prayer. And so one of the things, if you're a part of a local church, one of the things that is your responsibility in this church, right? The privileges and responsibilities of membership. A responsibility is for you to pray the Lord's Prayer on behalf of others to cover the other brothers and sisters that you show up with on Sunday, to cover them in these prayers, to, to pray that joy would be guarded against temptation, right? To pray that Jerry would be delivered from the evil one. Deliver him from the evil one, Lord. Jerry needs believers praying for him on his behalf. This is, this is part of the Lord's prayer, that we would be praying this for each other. So if you wake up in the morning, you're like, what in the world do I have to pray about? I want you to think about every single face in this room and say, well, have I prayed that they would be guarded from temptation today? That the Father would guard their path away from a temptation to sin that would overtake them? Have I prayed that they would have deliverance from the evil one? Well, that's something to pray about then, right? That's something to pray about. We need this. I need this. I need you. I need Miss Judy. I need Paul. I need Riley back there. I need you to come to me and say, hey, Pastor Jared, can I pray for you for a second? Father, I pray that you would guard this man from temptation. Temptations will come to him every day this week. Father, strengthen him against temptation. Oh, that I had a church that would walk up to me and pray that I'd be kept from temptation. I need that. You need that. Let's be that for each other. Let's talk about temptation all the time because it comes every day, <laughs> right? Let's talk about our temptations. How are you being tempted this week? That shouldn't be a strange conversation. Well, I don't know if I can talk about that. You should. You want help? You want deliverance? One of the ways we find deliverance is through the community, through a ministry of deliverance, through regular intercession, and then through an inner healing team, through an inner healing team, a deliverance team. We get that from Galatians chapter number six. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you give in to temptation. You who are spiritual, spiritual ones, uh, in the Greek, it's the, those, who, those who are of the pneumatikos, which is the same word used in the spiritual gifts passage in 1 Corinthians 12. Those who have spiritual gifts, who are in tune with the Spirit, a group of people in the church, the spiritual ones, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Gentle deliverance. <laughs> Gentle restoration. Keep watch on yourself, though, deliverers, those who are part of the Rafa Room team, those who are part of Deliverance Ministry, keep watch on yourself because a special temptation, the devil has special temptations just for you. For those who deliver, for those who partake in Deliverance Ministry, he adjusts his strategy. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. That's why we as a church who are not part of the Rafa Room teams need to be praying for Rafa Room's ministry. This is why we have Freedom Global on the intercession sheet every Wednesday because there are special temptations for Lori and her crew that the enemy tries to attack them with, and they need to be supported with prayer. The Rafa Room team needs to be supported with prayer. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. But what is this ministry, this, the spiritual ones who are there to help us be restored? They're bearing one another's burdens, and they're fulfilling the law of Christ. One of the taglines of our Rafa Rooms is deliverance. This is the word from the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from the evil one. How does the Father answer the prayer? Deliver us from the evil one? One of the ways is by giving us the ministry of deliverance and then equipping, filling with power and wisdom and experience and spiritual gifts, a small group of people who are specialized to say, oh, the enemy tripped you up again? We can help you. 
with the spirit of gentleness, they restore us. The Roth Rooms ministry is for this church, and it's not a one-time thing. You can utilize it over and over again. The Lord has graciously gifted us with this crew of people who have devoted their time and their life to being that group of spiritual ones, learning the ways of the Father, learning all the schemes of the enemy. If you're a teenager and you keep getting tripped up by sin, schedule a Roth Room appointment. They would love to help you. This is one of the ways that the Father delivers his people. Thank you.